Hello and welcome to Activating Greatness. I'm Nathan Crane, an award-winning author, documentary filmmaker, and health and wellness expert. And I'm Derek Crane, a certified personal trainer, health and fitness coach, and trainer of professional athletes. Each week, we broadcast new episodes with experts on life, health, fitness, business, and leadership to help you manifest the greatness that's already within you. Activating Greatness is about helping you live your life to your fullest potential and live with more meaning, purpose, health, and fulfillment. In this episode, we're talking with Dr. Michael D. Maria. Michael's a four-time Grammy nominee, an award-winning composer, and five-time number one chart-topping recording artist. Michael has won seven ZMR awards, including Album of the Year, and is also a Native American Music Award winner. Additionally, Michael's been serving clients and students in an integrative, holistic approach to health and wellness for over 30 years. Michael's also the author of the new book, Peace Within, Clear Your Mind, Open Your Heart, Embrace Your Soul, and Heal Your Life. And before we dive in, we want to thank our sponsors for helping make this podcast possible for you. Performance tea is something both Derek and I drink and love. One thing we really like about it is that it's handcrafted in small batches and made of the best medicinal herbs. We're both huge believers and consumers of herbs and love the healing benefits that herbal medicine brings to the body. Go to performancetea.com and use the code ACTIVATE15 to get a 15% discount off your order. They have incredible teas for energy, focus, recovery, and balance. Again, that's performancetea.com and use the code ACTIVATE15 to get a 15% discount today. So if you're ready to activate the greatness that's deep within you, let's dive into this inspiring episode. Michael, thank you so much for being with us. It's great to be here, Nathan. I always enjoy getting a chance to work with you. And Derek, it's great to be connected with you as well. Any friend, much less a brother of Nathan's, yeah. a friend and brother of mine. So it's great to be with you guys. I'm excited about being on the show. Awesome. So you offered to open up with a little bit of um, beautiful flute. So maybe we can utilize this moment just to close our eyes and, and connect to our hearts and listen to this uh, beautiful music that Michael has to offer us. And by the way, if you're driving, of course, don't close your eyes, but you can tune into this music and allow it to just help bring that peace within you while you're driving. If you're sitting or laying down or at home, Certainly feel free to close your eyes and just pause and allow this moment to connect and deepen in with your inner self and your, and your heart. So here we go. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Mm, thank you. Totally my pleasure, guys. It's uh, no matter how difficult or challenging a day has been, picking up one of my flutes and within the first second note, I'm, I'm in a different place. So and one of the great joys of my life is that something that gives me so much inner peace has had a chance to touch other people's lives and provide that peace for them. And it's, uh, when we talk about um, cultivating greatness, you know, one, one way a teacher of mine would talk about it is when our greatest joy 
touches the greatest need of the world, it's like striking a match. And it's that, it's that, it's that kind of energy that we know we're doing our life purpose or we're, our, we're sharing our gift or giving our gift away, which is what it's meant for. And there's few things in my life that do that like music and in particular playing the flute so so thank you for uh it put me in the right space for our time together speaking of we were listening to your album ama uh about 30 minutes prior to this interview and it just when you walked into this room from uh from the dining room you walk into this room here in my house immediately it was like we're transported to like this super meditative like it's like whoa i just entered like a temple or something it was it was quite incredible so you know your music certainly has that ability to connect uh, immediately to that inner space of peace um, but that brings up you know my first question music is certainly one way right and and in your book you talk about a lot of different things people can do to cultivate peace and to to activate their peace from within but um but i want to know about you as well right because uh, we all face chaos and turmoil in our lives, and, and those are often the hardest times to, you know, remember these practices, to put on the CD, to go into our breath, to do these things to actually find that peace, um, because you're just, you're in the midst of the chaos, right? So maybe you can start with, you know, what was uh, maybe one of the most chaotic times in your life, and what were some of the ways you were able to find peace in those moments? Yeah, great question, Nathan, and, and you know, very, I'm very upfront about it in Peace Within, and you know, it, it's uh, it's on the back, you know, that you know, from suicidal despair to become a four-time Grammy-nominated recording artist, you know, I share my journey from incredible uh, dark night of the soul, and that was in 2004. I went through just a very difficult year from. I had, a, um, people don't like to talk about these things, but you know, I had a, a client I'd worked with who committed suicide. And that is a psychologist probably worst nightmare. And, um, and I also had a, um, a very painful uh, betrayal by a business partner. And then I had a knee and a back injury. And I'm a very physical person. I at the time, I was a Vision Quest guide. I did a lot of wilderness retreats. I had to cancel that, which was one thing I loved to do. I could not, uh, uh, I could barely walk, much less I couldn't sit cross-legged for almost a year, and so I couldn't sit on my meditation space. Um, and I wasn't exercising, as you guys know, as athletes. I mean, you know, when your body's used to getting that serotonin boost and dopamine boost by by working out, and and so I know I also my my serotonin just bottomed out, but I. I did, and then Hurricane Ivan hit where we were, we were displaced from my home, which I'm actually in right now, um, for a number of years. And it was very, uh, Hurricane Ivan, we had 15 feet of water come across our neighborhood. 80, 90% of the houses were gone. Um, the pictures you see of Mexico Beach, and Panama City, which is just to the east of me here, that's how our neighborhood looked. There was nothing but, you know, cement uh, um, foundations. So I found myself just in this really dark place. And you know, here I'd been a very successful um, teacher, uh, you know, professor at university, uh, clinical psychologist, integrative wellness professional and coach, um, yoga meditation teacher, and uh, author, speaker. And I, I didn't think I could get through the next day. You know, every day was like just a trial. And, you know, I tell this story, I would carry around a picture of my daughter in my pocket so I wouldn't commit suicide. And I think it's something we need to talk about because, you know, vets today, 22 to 40 vets a day are committing suicide. We have a million people on the planet that commit suicide globally a year. And it's gone up, you know, 10 to 15% in the last 10 years globally, um, and in particular in this country. So despair literally means, it comes from the French, despare, despare in French is, is hope, and day is without. So despair is when we are without hope. Mm. You know, we literally go through a period where we lose hope. We, we get tunnel vision, we can't see a way forward. I think there's two things that the myth I like to dispel is 
is awakening and enlightenment. There's such big buzz terms. But anybody who's worked with any real genuine teacher will tell you, I don't care how awake and how where you are, there are days that you can be in the dark. Right. And say the one that is awake is the teacher, the one in the dark is the student, and we take turns. We're all taking turns all the time. One day I may be more awake and I'm the teacher. The next day you might be more awake and you're the teacher. And you know, and I've kind of fallen off the horse. What I love about that is because part of really cultivating a deep, mindful, inner peace practice is cultivating an ongoing practice of returning to our mm. center. Right. You know, we talked about Qigong a little bit. You know, I, I have a lot of background in, in the soft martial arts, in Tai Chi, Qigong. And it's, it's, this, it's this understanding of the circularity of energy, just like the circularity of the spinning of the earth going around the sun, the spinning of the, the, the solar systems around the galaxy, the, the spinning, um, or the, what's called the spiral path, you know, mm. throughout history. So to first not beat yourself up about being in the dark again. It's so like every night we go to sleep, you know, every night we're entering the dark. So it's, it's really one of the, especially, and you know, we were talking about going to retreats with a lot of, you know, high level people and they've all got their stuff. We all have our stuff. We all take our lumps. And to really, because the first thing we do in our culture, and we have a real obsession with thinking that somehow um, we should be immune from the bad, if we're awake and enlightened, we should be immune from the dark mood, uh, the despair, the pain of just being human. You know, the first noble truth is life is suffering. And I always love that. So those were the things that brought me there, the things that brought me back to center because I couldn't do my seated meditation, actually one of the things I talk so much about in the Peace Within book is a lying down meditation practice um, called Yoga Nidra. And Yoga Nidra, you're probably familiar with, but it's a very deep, somatic, mindful meditation done lying down, um, eyes closed, and you're doing a progressive exploration of the body, like almost a body scan, with a progressive awareness of releasing um, all kinds of uh, tension, physical, mental, and emotional tension. And you're in Shavasana, which is considered the most challenging yoga pose because there's nothing more challenging than releasing all of your mental, physical, and emotional tension. The that's, other, that's my favorite yoga pose, by the way. <laughs> I call it our first and our last pose. We <laughs> the world that way, we leave the world that way. Um, the last thing I will say about it is the other thing in Yoga Nidra is bringing opposites into awareness and experiencing them simultaneously. So hot and cold, joy and pain, a pleasure and pain, um, left and right, um, you know, comfort and discomfort, stress and comfort, uh, non-stress or peace. And then you, you bring them into awareness and, and allow the mind to be aware of them simultaneously, which moves you in a bit more into this non-dual consciousness or awareness. So you're, it really allows you to be with discomfort, pain, struggle, with more peace. So peace within, I would say it's peace within life. It's peace within suffering. It's not that we're going to imaginally do a spiritual bypass and avoid the pain, but we're bringing it to awareness, but also seeing a larger context to it. And, and also oftentimes we bring that pain and pleasure together. You, you pop into this very interesting state that's, that's non-cognitive. It's, it's more of a felt sense of just being. Um, we really are literally moving from the neocortex to the sensory motor cortex, which is this kind of global awareness. And people experience that. And you know, I know you have Qigong, and that, that's a place you experience a lot. So I know that's a long answer, but those are, so those are you know, my own, and it's in, in going to detail in the book about it, as we know. Yeah, and I think, you know, the biggest takeaway um, from that part of, of your journey, that part of your story that I'm hearing is, um, one, accepting that we're all going to face our challenges, our dark nights of the soul, our, 
you know, um, I just talked with a family member today who's like in a deep valley in her life right now. And I said, just keep focusing on the positive and keep focusing on what you want. And But I think the deeper essence of, of what you're sharing is that without a consistent practice like Qigong or these meditations or practices that you share in your book, it's significantly more challenging, right? Because if you don't have a spiritual, mental, emotional energetic practice to turn to daily in those times, then you are going to feel significantly more lost. I know that I was in the past as well without a, without a daily practice. And, and when I do have a daily practice, you know, I could be in the, you know, deepest, darkest challenges uh, that I've ever faced, which I went through something like that a couple of years ago, but I still had hope. I was, you know, I was only in despair for a short time, but it was the practice of, you know, these types of uh, spiritual practices have brought me out of that. So I think yeah. that's yeah. something you've done really well in this book is made it super practical for people to say, hey, here's things you can do right now. I that's, think it's important. Uh, yeah, thank you, Nathan. And I, that was my goal. I wanted to find something that was companionable, something that you could really carry with you. I get pictures a lot where people just, I was walking on the beach the other day, taking this long, you know, walk at sunrise. And there's this woman and she's just like, you know, the, the, this book is like, you know, I said, what are you reading? And she, and she was reading this mm-hmm. and it was really, really sweet. <laughs> was like, she said, I take it everywhere with me. I journal in it. And so the idea was something that people can, um, it's like a companion. And I love workbooks in that way. So I wanted to make something that, you know, I really is practical and give you actionable steps. And, and yes, um, when we are feeling lost, um, it's the practice of returning to our center. And, you know, sometimes very simple things like that releasing into the now, which is a Qigong practice, um, when, you know, or just, you know, the deep diaphragmatic breathing, um, deep full body breathing. Um, you notice all the things about breathing up to the sky and back down to the earth, what we call earth breathing, where you imagine that breath going back into the earth and then back up into your body. So these things, I do my yoga nidra before bed every night and first thing I do upon awakening. So I'm doing anywhere from an hour to two hours of practice a day just with yoga nidra. And it, they, they're the bookends of my day. And I, I don't know how people do it without that. You know, really- you know, it's interesting because an hour to two hours a day for a lot of people sounds like so much, but I have to agree with you that, you know, I started doing this awakened vitality practice from uh, Wisdom Healing Qigong from Master Ming Tung, who we were talking about offline a little bit. And I do that first thing I wake up, I wake up, have a little bit of tea and I, and, and it's a 30 or 40 minute practice. And like, it, you know, I used to do yoga when I first woke up or something, but what I realized in doing this kind of, you know, these meditation visualization practices, and there's so many and you, you share a lot of wonderful ones too, but starting your day with that and then ending your day with that, I've been doing sound healing at night before bed or lift chi up, pour chi down, which is another Qigong practice. Um, it's like, it, it, it really does. It stabilizes you. It centers you. It grounds you. It connects you to that, that deeper part of yourself. And I think that's what we all need right now, especially with the, the, chaos and turmoil that's going on around this country and around the world. Amen. Amen, brother. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. And yeah, in particular, you know, the traditions of particular yoga, that sleep is seen as one of the most sacred practices of the day. You know, it's both, it's a fast, it's literally a fast. We're supposed mm-hmm. to break fast. Breakfast is a breaking of this fast. It's, um, it's a meditation it's incredibly restorative and we in the west particularly with our technological age um see it as a nuisance you know how many people i know it's like gosh i could just you know if i had a few more hours in the day or i feel like when i'm sleeping i'm wasting time oh to me to the soul and the spirit that is like you know totally missing the point that actually we're going to our roots we're going to our depth so the idea of how we move into and sleep are And again, these really ancient wisdom traditions like Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and and you find it in mystic Christianity. But any deep, really deep wisdom traditions understood that sleep is really a deep embrace of our deepest essence. In fact, yoga nidra means yogic sleep. 
So the idea is you're actually really moving into that deep sleep state, which is a delta wave sleep where you're tacitly aware. So it's deep dreamless sleep, but you're actually aware. And as that happens, you begin to experience your dream yoga where you're actually kind of aware of the dream of the day. Um, but it also makes your ability to drop into sleep deeper and makes that sleep more productive when you're there. Mm. So, I so can't, I, wait to, can't wait to try it. Oh, it, yeah. And part of the piece within online, I have, I take people through that they can actually read it like themselves. It can be a uh, piece within blind down meditation, which is yoga nidra in here, into like their phone and then play it back. You can have a friend do it. Um, there's a couple of nice ones online, but if you do the my online program, um, I actually have my own that you download. And I, one of the practices I suggest people starting doing that at least once a day. I think I start with three times a week and then over the weeks I try to build people up to, to once a day. Beautiful. Um, it, yeah, it's, uh, I, I love that you get that because it is. It, it's a practice of return to our essence, return to being, return to presence. Yeah, that's so true. So Michael, you talk about the emotional circulatory system within the book, could you dive into that and just say like how it works and um, like the function of it? Thank you, Derek. I, I love talking about it. And it was something, it's um, something that I coined just because I, you know, again, in our culture, we have an aversion to feeling. In fact, it's funny, one of the books I recommend a lot, it's out of print right now, I think, is The Language of Feeling, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Viscott. And I have so many people, particularly men, unfortunately, who like are, can be so out of touch with their, their feelings. And what happens is we create, we start creating this avoidance to um, negative feelings. And if we start numbing ourselves to negative feelings, we also begin to, we can't selectively numb ourselves. We'll numb ourselves to, to all feeling. Yeah. So the emotional circulatory system is based upon the idea that feelings are moving through us all the time. Feelings are simply energy and that, you know, particularly when we think about the chakras, um, that these emotions are like colors. Um, or I also talk about it in terms of the breath, um, that this, the, our cardiovascular circulatory system is this complex, beautiful combination of, of blood circulating through the body. And part of in yoga nidra will do body sensing where you're actually imagining experiencing the blood flow in and out of uh, the different extremities and being oxygenated as the oxygen is coming into the body and then expelling the, the carbon dioxide and, and the, the toxic stuff. So this is happening emotionally too, that what I'm trying to get people to do is deep breathing to be curious and begin to look within, to be aware of, own, and express the emotions that are rising, passing through awareness, and dissolving. So all emotions have this arc of arising in our awareness and into our sensory awareness, as well as our mental and emotional awareness, passing through that awareness and then dissolving. So it's like you know clouds floating by or boats moving down a river. And so what's really helpful is when people realize feelings move. In fact, they come from emotion, literally means, uh, comes from the Latin emovere, which means to move. So they're both moving through us, but they also move us. Um, feelings are not right or wrong. They simply are the building blocks of motivation. Um, if I'm angry at you, I want to move against you. If I'm scared of you, I want to move away from you. If I love you, I want to move with you. So these emotions are constantly moving us through life. And again, they're not good or bad. So a couple of things about emotional circulatory system. This is natural. It's organic. They're supposed to be there. And the key to them is not judging them, becoming curious about them, and create as much spaciousness for them to move through you. Um, and I tell you, emotions are not behavior. So I can say in this tone of voice, you know, um, gee, I'm really, really pissed off right now. I'm, and I'm really hurting about what you just said. That's different than most people with, they associate anger with aggression, which is a behavior or violence. So it's not about getting rid of emotions, but beginning to move and work with them in a way that's more skillful. And more and more research is showing that 
repressed emotion is at the root of a tremendous amount of mental and physical disorder. Right. So we know people with heart disease usually have real hard times of anger. Like they tend to either have really repressed anger or have no emotional healthy outlet for their anger. You know, that was studies done back in the 60s that showed that people that tended to have strokes and heart disease had lots of repressed, unintegrated or dealt with, or what we call processed anger. So um, that's a that's a general overall. Uh, does, does that make sense? Do you have any questions about that? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it it um, it reminds me of um, you know the common practice, uh, at least here in the West, for most people who are who are raised, especially young men, is to you know store your emotions, hide them away. Don't be a don't be weak or, you know, whatever. Right. And so we grow up thinking like, Oh, I can't show weakness or can't be scared. Or, but that always turns into, you know, typically insecurity, which can be masked as aggression or masked as massive ego. Right. Or can be super insecure where then we don't even, you know, feel comfortable in our own skin. And so I love what you're saying and the practices you're sharing, which is one accepting that all emotions they're, they're not good or bad. They are part of us and we need to learn to move through them and allow them to flow through us because otherwise they, they store us as a, you know, the teachings of, of Qigong, we're still talking about that, right? Is that those, everything's energy. And so emotions store as energy and the longer that you condense them into energy blockages, they eventually can turn into diseases, joint pain, physical pain, things like that. And now the, the scientists or, you know, our modern scientists are confirming that um that that's true right um so so releasing the energy releasing the energy releasing the emotions transforming them allowing them to flow through and so that reminds me you and i spoke a while back um your mother passed recently right and that you know for most of us losing a parent is one of the most challenging emotional things that, that we could ever go through and yet you told me this incredible story of of um what you went through with her. Maybe you can share a little bit of that and, and maybe share a little bit of how we all can deal with death, um, losing somebody close to us uh, a little yeah. bit better. Absolutely, Nathan. Thank you for, uh, you know, uh, leaning into that. Because again, you know, not only do we have a, a taboo on, on emotions, um, particularly, particularly taboo on tenderness and vulnerability in our culture, right. uh, but we also have, you know, a taboo on death and grief, you know, and it's like the idea too is if you do lose somebody, you should be back at work on Monday, you know, it should take a week or two, or I can't tell me people come in. It's like, you know, I can't believe I'm still, you know, you know, she died two months ago and I'm still struggling. Or I, I had literally a gentleman come in the other day who's lost both parents within a year and a half. And he goes, you know, um, what was the word to you said? Um, you know, me and my partner, it's like, um, it's like get over it already, you know. Mm. This, and and to me, the, the the first thing I want to say is that I, I see, particularly the process I went through, uh, but this is true of anybody who may be struggling with this right out there right now, or or has gone through it. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for deepening. So this idea of deepening is deepening presence, deepening depth of uh, of our sense of opening the heart. Um, I think of the heart as like an aperture, you know, and emotions are the water flowing through our heart. And most of us, you know, pain and, and difficulty really, if we allow it, open that heart chakra. And the more we allow those tears to come, like the first thing I want to say is, you know, trust your tears. You know, they're taking you home. And when you, when you are, when you're compassionate of your grief, it actually begins to um, open up your heart. So the heart becomes broken open and not just broken apart. Mm. Um, you know, coming back to the flute again, one of the reasons I, I love the flute, one of, one of many, one is because making the, the, no, the, the sound, I have to use my breath, and it makes me breathe deep from the belly. It makes me slow down my breathing. But to the Cherokee, the Cherokee call the flute the long human being. And the reason they do that is they say that 
we are a flute. Human beings, they love to compare to a flute and say that we're here to be hollowed out so creator can play us. And, and I love that. So when we're in a grieving process, I love the image of being hollowed out, that I'm being hollowed out of my ego, which is the part that thinks it's in control, that it's gonna think it's gonna will its way through life. I talk about this in here quite a bit. This is the, the 25th anniversary of my first vision quest with the Blackfoot elder. And what I learned from that is, you know, in the West we have this image of life as being like climbing a mountain. You know, it's like very will driven. You know, I've got this goal and I'm gonna make it happen. In more spiritually advanced cultures and wisdom traditions, they liken it more to going down a river you've never been down before. Mm. And so the idea is this, there is, there are those things that we're not in control of and aging, sickness and death are the top three, right? You know, this is what they, you know, avoided having Buddha experience in the palace, the people who don't know his story. And, you know, part of his wanting to become awakened was, you know, how to approach aging, sickness and death, the inevitability of, of aging, sickness and death in a way that um, minimizes suffering and maximizes awakening. So what I was able to do both as I was playing for her is number one, feel all of my feelings, not shut down around the grief, let myself cry. Now I didn't necessarily always do that with, but we cried a lot together. Um, we learned to gaze into each other's eyes without saying anything. And I, you know, I, the, the story I told with you, and, and I'm actually looking at this name of my next album I'm working on, which is, a, I've never done a solo food album, and that's what it's going to be. Her last three breaths, it was three years fighting cancer, died in my arms one time, came back, had a, a pacemaker put in, lived another two more years. And then she was in hospice for nine months. They said she'd probably gone in a week or two and she lasted nine months. She was a, she just didn't want to leave, you know? Wow. <laughs> so yeah. it, was very, it was very painful, but also I know her soul was doing work. And that's the other thing I would tell people is it takes what it takes. I mean, some people are longer drawn out, there's longer buys, some are short, but you're dealing with that afterwards. Um, there's a great little book that says, you know, leave nothing unsaid. But really feel your feelings, honor your grief, speak your truth, you know, tell this person. We find with hospice workers that we see this happen over and over again, that the people really have a deep need to express gratitude, um, to forgive and be forgiven. So there's incredible opportunities for really deep work around healing. Um, as her body disintegrated, I saw her soul just grow and become like smooth as silk. I mean, she got so awake towards the end and, and it was just amazing to me um, how she almost became like pure spirit at the end. And the other thing I like to say, the Cherokee talk about the rainbow bridge, that part of what's happening in grief is that like the rain, Tears are like the rain. And if you cry all of your tears, every tear is building a bridge from your heart in this world to their heart in the other world. So that becomes a rainbow bridge where you can begin to still communicate with them, but you speak with the mouth of your heart and listen with the ears of your heart. And I found that to be true, both with my grandmother and my mother, that um, they become more present through their absence because I just went all the way through it. I mean, I just did not avoid a tear, you know, and I, there were times I was sobbing on the floor when I came home. There's times that I just, when I felt the wave, I would surf it. I would just let it come through me. The other thing though was, I'd like to say, when you're feeling the feelings, and I talk about this in the book, allow it to be pure sensation and pure energy moving through you. Because what's happening when we get stuck in depression, like I tell people, normal healthy grief is like going through rapids on the river of life. If you feel them, you'll get to calm water. But depression is a little eddy or whirlpool on those rapids. Mm. And that's created through cognitive thoughts and judgments about the grief. And, de and denial too, right? Done. So repression 
or like if somebody you know like oh things never work out for me or life sucks or i'm you know i nothing you know everybody leaves me um i'm you know bound to just be left and abandoned um, those are cognitive judgments that are superimposed on the grief and that takes you down into a spiraling negative uh, and that's where de depression is often very full of negative self-judgment or negative other judgment or ne negative life judgment um, and really that's really what moves us into that despair but good healthy pure grief just like sadness you know this is sad and letting yourself feel it and i tell people if you you know we do this in my yoga classes like there's a there's a hindu practice right? yogic practice called laughing and crying and you start crying so much until you start laughing and then you start <laughs> laughing so much you start crying <laughs> And then they go start circling and they're, it's based upon their Hindu saying, um, all there is in heaven is laughing and crying. You know, and it, it massages a similar part of the belly. So if people can become curious about that, not only is it a deepening process, but it's an incredible opening of the chakras, you know, and, and you can see this as people age, the people who become lighter as they get closer to death, you know, you, you can see it in their face, you know, are they, getting closed and bitter or the opening and become radiant you know like the sun and and it's all about how we lean into our grief mm. and let it cleanse us versus resisting it mm. yeah beautiful powerful so that that kind of leads me to the next experience most of us have right it's when a loved one or a family member or a friend shows up at your door and, and um, starts, you know, talking about all the problems that they're going through and all the challenges and, you know, how easy it can, I mean, you love that person, right? You want to help them. And, and I know one of two things can often happen. One, you can either get sucked into that energy and then you know, rather than being able to actually help them, you just feed it. Or two, you know, what are some of the things that, that you would suggest people do to actually help that person and help yourself not get sucked into that energy so that there's more opportunity for healing and you know positive transformation to happen beautiful question nathan i am a major recovering codependent I, you know i've been recovered from codependents you know us codependents find our ways into the helping profession so often and and the whole thing is you know how do you how do you help? How, how do you be of help and service without losing yourself? You know, and, and so the first metaphor I like to, to give is that, and I have a whole section in here on peace within relationships, and I talk a lot about codependency. A nice image is it's like walking through the woods with someone and they fall in quicksand. And the immediate response, you know, or instinct is you want to grab their hand and pull them out. But more often than not, you, they're going to pull you in with them. So I always tell people, don't let somebody pull you into the quicksand. Get a rope and tie that rope onto a tree. Because sometimes the person doesn't even want to get out. And if you're trying to pull them in, you may not as want to pull you in. Um, and so the first thing is really uh, be aware of that. And I tell people this. I mean, I've been doing this over 30 years, but I tell them, I don't heal anybody. I can create the conditions where healing is more possible. Like I don't make a seed germinate, but I can create conditions where it's highly likely. So the other thing I like to tell you that I don't have any answers. You know, I can help hold a, a lantern up to your heart and help you discover what's true for you. And that really is also really wonderful. And, and also having a healthy sense of self and self care and, and know that, you know, um, we are not the healers, but we can provide space where healing can happen. And I think it's particularly kind of a tricky place now because a lot of people out there that genuinely may have real access to healing energy um, can confuse that energy with themselves, you know, and, and that's a setup that will hurt themselves and sometimes others. So it's really important to know where your limits are to have healthy boundaries. A boundary is not a wall. So I tell people, and I actually have a whole section on the online program where I have like 
you know, these thick lines where people kind of insulate themselves. And, you know, we know this kind of person who's like, you wouldn't even go to talk to them because it's like, they're not emotionally available at all. So that's a wall. But then those of us who may struggle with codependency where we don't have a boundary, a healthy boundary between self and other. And it's, it's unfortunate because those of us who are very empathic and highly sensitive, um, part of empathy and sensitivity is, is being able to, to move through that boundary and touch other people and, and, and take on their suffering so you know what they're feeling. But I always talk about it as kind of like a cell membrane where it met, lets good stuff in, but it keeps bad stuff out. Mm. Another image I use is a golden screen that allows good stuff in, but repels negativity. And to know, it's like if I'm working with somebody or talking to somebody, um, friend, client, student, and my energy is getting drained, to be able to give myself permission to say, gee, this has been really great. It's been good. You know, I'm glad we touched base on these things, but I really, you know, I've had enough today. <laughs> you know, like this is where I'm at my limit. And and the people who really value you will, will honor that. So it's really about having some healthy boundaries and also remember that we are not the healer, but we can provide the conditions where healing can happen and spend more time listening than fixing. Mm, um, yeah, I just, speaking on that, I just went through, I was telling you offline, I was at the six day wisdom healing Qigong retreat yeah. at the cheese center and one of the practices we did there every day was as we would get in small groups and each person would share where their highlights where their low lights where the biggest challenges they're facing and part of our practice in the group was to sit and listen without trying to offer advice without commenting just really tuning into our body into our heart and just fully listen uh, without necessarily taking it on but without giving anything either because that can be the hardest thing for, for so many people in this, in this space, in this field, right? Someone shares with something, we immediately want to comment or help right. them or whatever, but wow, this was so powerful. Just sitting, listening. I had to stop myself and stop other people multiple times. Like, wait a minute. No, we're just supposed to just listen. And, um, and, and, and they start talking themselves into their own solutions. It, it's, that's it. it's incredible. Yeah, it's and that's what I, I do. These heart warrior and uh, uh, heart, um, centered soul oriented talking circle and uh, the heart warrior practice we do is when we have a talking feather or talking staff and the first thing I always say is I don't have any answers I don't have any answers um, there's a Robert Frost poem that says we sit around the circle and suppose well, where the mystery sits in the middle and knows so what I try to do is encourage people to speak from the heart and listen from the heart and go to the heart of what they need to say, and that's often when they're going to find their own solutions. Um, and then they're really, um, that you really actually, what a gift you've given them then. And to tune into their own deep inner knowing or inner wisdom, and to know that this, that that's what they call innate wisdom traditions, that we all have the wisdom innately within us if we're given the space and time to connect with it. And, you know, that's why I love that you're involved with that. I mean, my first real sacred book was the Tao Te Ching, which was, I was given to when I was, I guess, 16, 17 by a guy who started teaching me some Tai Chi and Chi Kung. So it's this, all, what I'm teaching is a physical embodiment of this book. And it was the one thing that sat on my, my uh, bedside table for probably 20 years was the Tao Te Ching. And I still just, it's full of that sense of, um, the paradox of knowing that the wisdom is always within. Yeah. And it comes from not the head as much as the heart and just being and being present to that place, which is non-dual and, and beyond um, explanation. So, so it's really, it's really beautiful. The last thing when you were talking about, I had this image, you know, when uh, the old, physicians before they had a stethoscope what they do you know in the ancient times was actually put their ear to the other person's heart mm. and I, I sometimes imagine that that's when we're really listening to somebody imagine that you know you're giving that kind of attention to their heart their, their emotional heart and you're not needing to do anything except listen and, and it's you know i'll say everybody needs a good listening to 
That'd be a powerful practice. That'd be something to try, actually. Let, let's, all, so. let's all share what's going on and, and then stick our, our ears to our heart. I'd, I'd love to experience that. Yeah, that's a great image. So, um, so somebody comes to you um, in, in immediate chaos. They just lost their job. Their you know, parent just passed away. Their, um, you know, their, their house just got taken by a storm. I mean, just total mental, emotional breakdown. Somebody you know, immediately going through this chaos. What are the first two or three immediate things you would recommend people to do? Let's breathe and really be right where we are, right where you are. You know, let's, let's stop and really fully be present with what's happening. You know, um, I would often, you know, once you close your eyes, take a few deep breaths. Let's bring your awareness. You might bathe the, the heart with the breath. And oftentimes we'll shift them to, can you talk, share me with an image or feeling that you're aware of in this moment? Um, so I'm really wanting to move them from the logical strategic analytic mind, which is the one freaking out because it's, it's unfortunately in our culture, we, we live from the left brain, which is the logical strategic analytic mind, which doesn't like chaos, um, and it, it sees all of that stuff as failure. Um, the other thing I would do is and I'll say this sometimes to be a bit provocative or evocative, and I, and I won't say it, it's, it's a, and I'll say it usually in this way, and I actually I have it in, in, in the book, uh, Carl Jung, I'm a very Jungian-oriented psychologist, and he'd always say, and I would say it this way, because I, I wouldn't say it directly to them, but I would say, you know, Carl Jung, the, the great psychologist of the 20th century, you know, whenever anybody came to him and said, oh, gee, I just got a promotion, um, I just, you know, I want a Grammy, um, I'm getting married, uh, whatever it might be. He'd always say, you know, if we could just keep our heads, maybe we can get through this without anything terrible happening. And then when they would come to him and say, you know, I'm at the end of my own rope, um, I painted myself into a corner, um, I've lost my job, I'm getting divorced, I'm complete, lost all hope. You know, he'd say in a Swiss accent, "Ja, gut, let's open a bottle of champagne. Now we'll really learn something about ourselves. <laughs> so, um, and I, I'll say, I'll usually get them to laugh, you know? And, yeah. And if I've told them before, when they come in later on, I'll say, "Ja, gut, let's have some champagne. <laughs> and having been to that place, you know, is, it, and being able to say that, because, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to be flippant about their tragedy. Right. But, does it does show that in our culture um, we have such an aversion to failure when that's that's where we grow uh, Rilke the great poet said I will tell you how a man grows by being defeated by greater and greater things mm. uh, and then my other teacher uh, my shamanic teacher would you know would say every initiation every tragedy is initiation to qualify you for more trouble and tragedy <laughs> because the higher level you get the more stuff will happen, right? <laughs> you see, this uh, thing, right? Right, um, right. You no, know, and you're not doing your work if that stuff's not happening. Um, it's a so, good way to. That's a great way to look at it because it's like, yeah, I mean, you're. I don't think you're ever gonna get to a point where you're not gonna have some tragedy or chaos or turmoil in your life, right? It's just graduating. How, how well are you able to start dealing with it? Is that's the secret. It, that's it. Yeah. Because otherwise, you get. It's just like physical injuries, as you know, you guys um, might know with, with people who have physical injuries, particularly like chronic back pain or something, develop what's called kinesiophobia, which means a fear of movement. Mm. But also kind of people become a fear of living or taking any risks when they had a setback. And when people say, gee, you know, this just ended badly or this is going to end badly, you know, um, I might say, well, you know, Everything on this plane ends badly. We all end up getting old and dying. <laughs> so, you know, what, what, are you, what are you trying to save yourself for? Um, so really the challenge is how can we take progressively more authentic creative risks? Now I want to be doing that in a way that's, you know, detrimental to ourselves or, or unwise. But real creativity requires risk. 
you know, of emotional wholeness requires risk, you know, risking speaking our truth. You know, when I first started talking about having been suicidal and stuff, you know, it was, it was scary. And now it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's like, yeah, of course. I mean, right. um, uh, Albert Camus said, if you haven't considered suicide, you're not really living, you know, <laughs> like, there's a choice, you know, you're consciously choosing. You actually, the weird thing about being human is we can contemplate our own death and deciding, no, I'm done. You know, <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. and if that's a, you know, it's an act of courage to keep living, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so I've come full circle with that. It, it, it was not that easy. You know, I was, I had the cultural virus of having to look good and have my stuff together, whatever that meant, you know, um, you know, which is really more about, you know, keep the fear away and keep pretending and keep your mask on. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's another big thing. I will share with people who are going through tra tragedy. I, I pray before a session about you know, creator, how can I be of help to this person? And if it feels right to share part of my story, um, I know I've learned so much from my teachers who've been transparent and have shared their dark times. And I know I come, have so many people come back to me and say, you know, seeing you and all you've done and for you to say you were there gives me hope that I'm not a lost cause, you know? And so I'm, I'm very willing to be open about my own dark times. And, and it's, it, it's not unusual for someone going through a dark time for me to share that too. So yeah. being present, listening to self, normalizing the darkness, sharing some of the darkness. Um, the last thing I'll say is I really try to encourage creativity. I think creativity is one of the most powerful responses to suffering and the dark night of the soul, whether it's music, drawing, poetry. Um, it's a way of the right brain getting in and making meaning out of the chaos. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. All all incredible pieces of, of advice. And I think, you know, also what I'm hearing from this is everyone should have somebody like you <laughs> that they can turn towards, who they can trust, who they can learn from, who they can listen to, who they can share their feelings with openly and without being judged. And, you know, might be able to point them in the right direction. Uh, having your book and CDs and taking your course and having those kinds of resources, you know, to turn towards in, in chaos. I think it's, you know, we think of it now, obviously, when you're not in chaos, it's like, um, or in trauma or whatever, it's like, oh yeah, of course, that's what I'll do. But the real secret sauce is when those things happen, having that foundation to go, oh, I need to go here. I need to do this meditation. I need to read this chapter in this book. And just, and I think the, 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 the key that really helps us is the daily practice, as we talked about at the beginning of this interview, right? It's a daily practice. So we always have that thing to turn back to. Yeah, that's beautiful, Nathan. And yeah, in addition to those personal practices, I want to just emphasize having a circle of support. Mm, yeah. I knew a uh, heart worry that this won't come out for another year probably, but I'm editing it right now, but I talk about, you know, having a soul friend and a soul doula, a soul midwife and a soul guide. And these are, you know, our soul friends are people who, um, and they may or may not be an actual professional therapist or coach. They may be, you know, but people who are um, accompanying you on this journey and will be there to hold your hand through the dark times, but also celebrate the good times. And we need each other. I mean, I think that's the other big thing is we need each other. And we're in such a period of divisiveness and fear of the other. And so that's why I love, you've always been really great at helping create community and, and doing these kinds of outreach things. And it's, this is, this is how we're going to heal ourselves in the world. And our, that's a huge thing. I, I, I try to encourage people to have a circle of soulful, heart-centered support. People where you can fully show up with who you are, light and dark, no difference. That you, people, at least one person, if not more, that loves you in your light and darkness. You know, that's just, we, we all need that. We all need that. Absolutely. So true. So the final question here, what is the number one thing that you would recommend people do to activate their greatness within themselves? 
Mm, great question to finish with there. Yeah, it gives me chill months. <laughs> uh, so the word genius is really misunderstood in our culture. You know, traditionally genius meant your your inner gift. And, and outside of our culture, most all of the cultures, traditional, particularly indigenous cultures, really function with the understanding that we each came here with a really precious gift for our people. And traditional tribes knew that actually for somebody, the most important thing for each person was to find out what their gift was. And the gift, you belong to the gift as much as the gift you and that, that the purpose your life purpose is sharing that gift with your people mm. and we, when you're sharing your gift you are belonging fully to your life and therefore you can't help but find your inner and outer greatness it's never going to be trying to be like someone else it's like how do you become fully you and one way of ask people that is what is most natural instinctual and effortless for you what brings you alive and gives you joy you know and, and that another way sometimes we talk about following your heart and we are just not given that freedom permission or support in our culture to do that you know um, i tell the story in, in the book and you know and how i at the time i had not even come out with my first album yet when i was a you know going off to school, I wanted to study either music or art or filmmaking. And my dad, who was an immigrant from Italy, I'm from foster homes. I mean, my dad actually laughed, you know, when I told him, he said, you know, you can't be an artist or musician. You need to be a doctor or lawyer. You need to make good on my sacrifices. It was, it was very much the kind of time of, you know, that was very much their generation. And, and I worked through it with him and I'm at peace with all of it. But it was very, very kind of wounding to my soul, you know? And it was only after my first Grammy nomination, I had this really big concert, my first big concert locally, you know, standing room only at one of the local churches here. And, and my parents came up afterwards and, and tears in my mom's eyes. We're so sorry we didn't encourage you in your music. Obviously it, it, it was gonna get out one way or the other. It's such a huge part of you. And I said, you know, it's all good. It's all sacred. My music probably wouldn't be what it is if I hadn't taken this journey into psychology. But I really tell, particularly young people, um, find out what makes your heart sing and follow your heart. Because if you're doing what you love, you're going to be good at it and more than likely you'll be great at it. Um, but if you're a pear tree, and you're trying to produce apples, you're not going to be very happy or very great at it. And this is the thing that most people in our culture they're trying to be something other than they are. And it's a very, it's a long journey to discover that. Uh, but then the greatness comes from the inside out organically, you know, because you're tapping in to what brings you alive. Mm, powerful, mm. powerful words of wisdom. Yeah, thank you so much. And I really want to encourage everybody tuning in, go to michaeldmaria.com. We'll put a link uh, below this video in the, in the description. You can go right to it. Um, there you can sign up for um, his free newsletter. He's got some great videos and practices you can start doing immediately. You can pick up his book as well, Peace Within. Um, also highly recommend this CD. I put it on my, my phone and my iPod so I can start listening to it while going to bed, just to help get into that meditative state. Um, and take a look at the Peace Within course as well uh, on his website. Again, it's michaeldmaria.com. We'll put the link below. Michael, it's, it's been an honor and a blessing, and uh, uh, it's so wonderful to connect with you again and just hear your incredible words of wisdom. We, we appreciate you being here so much. Well, it's always a joy, guys, and uh, just I've, I've really enjoyed whenever we connect over the years. I love what you're doing. Thanks for you know, just creating a space for us to share with, with others. And I wish you both all the success in the world with this uh, new venture. Thank you. That's Thank it you. for today's episode. Our hope and desire is that you get as much out of these interviews and episodes as we do. Each week, you can count on us being here to help you activate the greatness that's already within you. And we can all do that by continuing to develop and grow our minds, bodies, emotions, and connection to a higher purpose. 
please make sure to share this with your friends on Facebook, iTunes, Twitter, and Instagram. Tag Crane Factor and use the hashtag activating greatness so we can continue growing this community together and changing the world for the better. And a huge shout out to our sponsors for making this show possible. Head over to performancetea.com to try their recovery, balance, focused, and energy teas. These teas are made from incredible healing herbal plants that help your body heal, gives you natural energy, helps prevent disease, and help you feel better in every way. Again, that's performance tea, that's T-E-A, performancetea.com, and use the code ACTIVATE15 to get a 15% discount off your order. That code works on their website, and it also works on Amazon. Again, activate 15, and you'll get a 15% discount off of these amazing teas. We appreciate you tuning in and for supporting our sponsors who make this show possible. Remember, you already have greatness within you. You just need to activate it. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you on the next episode.